so good morning everyone. My only fear is falling off the stage actually and it's like really micro so <laughs> Jess you're in charge. <laughs> um, my other fear is that I flew in last night from Sydney and got in at about 1am and who knows what I'm going to say <laughs> after that. So, uh, But it's a real pleasure to be here and I'm so sorry I didn't make dinner last night so and, and um, I hope um, we're obviously ready for a full-on speed day, aren't we, with our speed dates and, and these speed learning events. So really happy to be part of that. <coughs> so um, I'm Anne Fulton. Um, uh, I'm part of Fuel 50, a founding part of Fuel 50, and I've got my colleague Jess um, uh, Towitz, who's based here in London, um, with me today. And Fuel 50, you may or may not have heard of us. Has anyone heard of us before? A couple, okay, yeah, that's great. I'll take that as a win. <laughs> um, but we are um, an organisation that's dedicated to the career experience for employees and increasingly the employee experience. So our passion is you know, the future of your workforce. So their individual futures with you and the future of your workforce in terms of the skills and capability that you're having within your organization so that there's alignment between your employees and um, your organization's goals and objectives. And we think that this is an increasingly important part of the learning experience for employees that they can see a why and a where. You know, why am I here and where am I going? So to us, that's a really important part of the equation. So um, we're working with some of the largest organisations across the globe. Um, so Walmart, that is literally the world's largest employer with 2.4 million employees, but eBay and MasterCard and Indeed and Aon. Um, I'm trying to think of some UK clients, but Schroders and Chubb and many others, um, DS Smith, Sky. So, so we, we're, um, you may or may, may not have heard of us, but we, have, we are delivering this experience to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of employees across the globe. So what I'd love to do today is talk to you around um, the new talent economy and why we need to be thinking differently about our talent within organisations today. So uh, we... There's some really um, strong reasons why we need to democratise the talent um, experience. So for us, you know, it, it, there are some new um, driving forces um, in the workforce that we need to be conscious of. And with 50% of the workforce by 2020, you know, like next year, are going to be millennial. Millennials have um, some very clear career expectations around the experience that they're expecting. So uh, for millennials, you know, it's, it's about transparency. It's about fairness, it's about acceleration, uh, it's about being able to use their, their talent and capability and make contributions in a meaningful way. So those are a lot of the things that we're hearing from, from this in, increasing um, impact on um, the economies that we're working within and why we need to start to rethink the um, talent equation within organisations and why there is a new power differential uh, that exists in talent um, management and talent systems today. So I do want to talk about how we can think about talent differently. So um, there are, coming back to some of the forces um, in the economy today that we need to think about, and what I want to talk about here is um, a piece of um, research that PwC did very usefully last year. And um, what they're um, projecting or predicting for us is that there are, there are four driving forces today um, that are driving new ways of thinking about uh, the future of work. So um, the yellow world is where humans come first, right? So it's a people-centric uh, business driver. The second world, um, where organisations are going to be increasingly innovation-driven. Um, the third world is this uh, meaningful work and, and where organisations care and social responsibility. We've, we've seen a lot of those drivers over the last five years. Um, and the blue world, which is where corporate is king. So what I'd like you to do is think about your organisation today. Um, which of those worlds would you say your organisation is um, driven by? So do we have any hands up for a, um, a yellow um, world within the organisation? I'm getting a few nods. Okay, yellow. You've got, you can choose one right now. <laughs> um, and this is today. So um, innovation, red world, 
Oh, lots. Okay, so examples of your organisation, what industry are you in? Um, support services, so building maintenance technologies to okay. uh, um, help buildings function correctly. Interesting. I wouldn't necessarily have predicted as being innovation driven, but that's fantastic. Another example, I saw a couple of hands up over there, of um, the industry within which you're playing. We, we build modular housing, so we're okay. building kinds of factories. Fantastic. Um, okay. Quite new Amazing. Mm -hmm. Super. Okay, great examples, thank you. Um, green, have we got some examples for green? Beautiful, what industries? Uh, we're fashion, we're okay. a Danish fashion company, so they're really, really into the sustainability. Amazing, yeah. it's not H&M, is it? No, it's not, <laughs> but it's a big competitor. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> yeah. name drop, please. Yeah. Best seller. Okay. Yeah, you have another, Jack and Jones, Vera Moda. Okay, so fantastic, yeah. awesome. Okay, lovely example. And then what about corporate, the blue world today? Okay, there's a few. I expected more to be blue today. Okay, what about your aspirational? Where do you think your organisation wants to be by 2030? Do you think there's going to be a shift? To yellow? Red, okay. Interesting. Okay, so we're seeing here in this room a driver towards the innovation rules. So this is one of the forces that's impacting the way that we're thinking about organisations today. The other one, obviously, that we all know about is the impact of automation. And, um, you know, automation is, is creating a lot of fear, both for organisations and also employees. <laughs> so uh, I think we just want to kind of myth, you know, uh, you know, kind of do a little bit of fact checking around automation, because what we actually know is that while 30% of work could be displaced globally um, by 2030 due to automation, if we actually deep dive into that, um, what we find is that it's 60% of roles that are impacted, 60% um, 60, 60 of roles have some activities impacted by automation, right? So the majority of roles are going to be impacted by automation in some ways, some activities. Only 5% of roles are going to be impacted directly by automation. So I think there's a correction there that needs to be made in our, in our, in our minds around the impact of automation. But what we do know is that we actually need to enable leaders to um, support people to, to um, adapt to the impact of automation on their roles. So that, you know, automation is going to affect you know, a lot of us and most of us, but we ha what we can see is that there's going to be a major impact uh, for leaders around how they enable their people to cope with that um, increasing automation component of their job. And it's going to become a, you know, a strategic uh, advantage for the organisations that do a good job of um, supporting their people to cope with automation. Um, so, you know, meanwhile, we've got 66% um, of organisations that are um, conscious that they've got a skills shortage today within their organisation. So, you know, thinking about the skills and the skill readiness of your people is becoming increasingly important. We also know that skills anxiety can go both ways, right? Um, I was recently doing a um, keynote presentation for Walmart employees and it was done virtually. So there were thousands and thousands of employees that had logged in. And because I was on a webinar, I could see the chat stream that was coming through. And what I was really shocked about was the number of employees that were really fearful that they didn't have the skills for the future. They knew it was coming at them, but they didn't have, the, they didn't feel ready to be able to um, adapt and prepare themselves for this changing work world. So skills anxiety is a real thing for employees. Um, in terms of the dynamics that are impacting an employee today, you know, we think about the careers landscape that has been massively disrupted. So the old, some of you who may have heard me speak before may have seen this, but it's still a powerful, important thing. So the old staircase of where you had a promotion every two <coughs> years, right, that went out not even last decade, that went out last millennium. It no longer exists. It is not, um, not a reality today. So instead, today's career experience for the millennials, particularly joining the workforce, it's much more about longer runs. So more time at the coal phase, more time at the front line, no job title change, no promotion. Um, so it's a kind of almost a flat line feeling for their career. And when there is a vertical, because they haven't had the steps that existed in the old world, they, uh, there is often career derailment and that people haven't necessarily picked up the experiences and the learning and the preparation for that promotion. 
So our challenge that we are working with these organizations across the globe is how do we help design um, learning experiences and stretch assignments and coaching and mentoring and um, learning gigs for employees during those longer runs. And what happens is if we can do a good job of designing that, what we're able to do is give an employee a sense of career acceleration and growth that's trackable, you know, it, it's, um, record, you know, it's being recorded, they're seeing their growth of their skills and capabilities and their preparation for the future. So it becomes a different kind of um, 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 negotiation or, or, or um, contract around skills development. So increasingly we're seeing skills and experiences as being the new career asset that people need to think about, not job titles. So we need to work more, move away from job titles and think more about um, the learning and experiences for employees and help them recognise that this is the new um, career um, you know, asset that they, they need to focus on. So that's part of our world. Um, I think also that careers increasingly are going to be roller coasters for employees. You know, the speed of change that's coming at them, um, and, and uh, employees are going to have to, ex you know, expect, you know, job job change and um, skills change for them in, in that world <coughs> ahead. So how do we help employees prepare for this roller coaster world? Um, I'm coming back to the skills gap that I talked about before, right? So you as organisations are having to think about how do, I, how do we make sure our employees have the skills that they need for the future. But what we find is that actually employees are incredibly motivated to um, grow their skills because of those factors I was just talking about. So 74% of employees actually want to um, you know, develop new skills and prepare themselves for the future. So they're hungry for it. All you have to do is provide them with the what and the how to start to improve their skills. And um, some of the what that we need to challenge the thinking. Um, I think there's a lot of um, rhetoric and talk today around how people need to prepare for automation and um, you know th these um, technology skills. So you know I, I need to you know I'm a developer and I need to be able to um, improve um, my ability to um, you know HTML code and, and work with machine automation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When we look across the globe of skills that are actually in demand, it's really surprising. And the skills that are in demand today across all organisations are still the softer skills. So um, the examples that we've got up here, which are out of our Fuel 50 system in terms of how we're presented, um, presenting them, but um, the skills that are in demand today are innovation, um, global collaboration, flexibility and adapt adaptability, leadership, creativity and problem solving. So it's still softer skills that are still in demand. So how do we enable our employees to start to build some of those skills that we need for the future? Um, what you're seeing is that there's a little flag um, up here you know, that's, so for employees, we will flag the in-demand skills in your organisation and, and flag that directly into the employee so that they know that they're investing in skills that may be in demand, either for roles that they're thinking about or roles for the future. So um, we also are aware uh, from our own research, and so Fuel50, I didn't tell you this before, but we are dedicated to quality research about what a best-in-class career experience looks like. You'll see the research paper sitting on your chairs, grab it. Then we've got some more research papers for those of you that are coming to meet with us, and also the book, The Career Engagement Game, which is how do you design a career experience for your organisation. So we're dedicated to that research. Our research <coughs> in 2017 was around career agility and how do we help organisations build that career agility. And what we found from that research paper was that 86% of your employees actually think that they have skills and talents today that are not being used by their organisation. So they've got more capability and it's an untapped resource for your organisation. So somehow we need to create the transparency to be able to join the dots between the skills and talents, untapped skills and talents that your employees have as well um, and the organisation needs. So coming back to the democratised talent experience that I wanted to talk about, we're talking about three key trends that we're working on um, as an organisation. So number one, you know, a fundamental um, 
uh, thing with you know a, 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 a democratic world is that there's equality, <laughs> and um, you know that there is um, that employees are powered up to own their own career and their future, and that there's um, a transparency that's part of um, this new world, new way of working. The second part of our um, approach to democratising talent is um, to power up line leaders. So in some senses we're challenging you guys here in HR. So some of the intelligence that typically sat um, only in HR around retention risks um, and skills forecasting and talent pipelines, we're increasingly putting that directly into the hands of line managers. So a line manager can see who may be a retention risk. So there's a new power game going on in, in the way that we're thinking about talent systems. Secondly, skills transparency, as I've been kind of hinting at, needs to go two ways, you know, for both the business and the employee. Let's make it really um, explicit and transparent around um, what is going to be needed for the future of this organisation and what me as an employee can do to help um, work on that skills um, gap or that capability. And then the third part of the equation is, is helping HR start to have really robust skills forecasting across the organisation. Organization. You know, imagine a world where you've got um, a beautiful asset base across your organisation of who's got what capability, who's got one, what untapped, who wants to go where. So it's that kind of skills and workforce forecasting that we're um, able to work on. So we believe that there's a virtuous gain cycle that goes on. So number one, if you can give your employees career path transparency, right, they can see where they can go. Um, you know, that they can, they can um, look at what options exist for them across the organisation. They engage with our system and we do a little quick, you know, little talent audit and skills audit for that person. That then goes into the um, organisation in terms of the skills and asset base. We've given employees a really powerful why. Um, to engage with the system and to give you that skills intelligence by um, providing them with a roadmap for where their future is. And so that gives us workforce skills visibility and then that builds out your beautiful succession and talent pipeline. So you can see across the organisation who is ready, you know, who's got the capability, who may be an emerging talent for what particular need within your business. So there's a beautiful dynamic going on there. And, and we think that there's two sides of the same coin pretty much going on is that Giving your employees that career path transparency has some beautiful gains for the business around that skills intelligence. So I'm going to give you three quick glimpses into the way in which we are um, thinking about and doing this. So number one, part one of the story is powering up your employees. So 42% um, of, of employees today, and I think in some organisations it's possibly even higher than this, um, are demanding you know, more transparency around um, their career path and their career growth plans. Mm -hmm. they're, they're hungry for it. The old world you know, that we are seeing, and I see it in some industries, um, we've just been talking advertising and media, you know, where sometimes talent decisions are made behind closed do doors, somebody's been earmarked for a certain role, and the whole thing happens before anyone else even knows about it. Employees are starting to get you know, quite angry <laughs> about that and really looking for that more transparency around their futures. So um, thinking about the millennials, right, they pick up their phone, they're, they're, they're looking at Google Maps, um, they're expecting a career experience today that is like Google. I put in my current location, I put in my destination, what is my journey? And that's the kind of exp expectation that millennials have, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a massive Uber you know, user, so same thing, current location, destination, it's that kind of thinking. So what Fuel50 are working on is, is providing that um, kind of transparency in terms of that journey. We also um, believe incredibly, and this is one of Jess's terms, um, is we believe in the art of the possible, right? So um, with this person here, product specialist sales, if they dream of becoming you know, the chief sales officer or the you know, VP of sales in their organisation, um, we, we say, yes, you can do that. We think that's great. Yes, that is a possibility for you. We might get, do a bit of expectation management and give them a match score. You know, so I'm sorry today, you only have a 25% match. Or you've um, joined a financial institute and you've got an MBA um, and you've come out and you've joined one of the big banks, say Lloyd's, and 
unfortunately the best job that you could get was in retail or in um, the contact centre. Um, but that person wants to become an investment bank and we go, yeah, you can do it. Here is how. Here is the roadmap and that journey. So. Um, Art of the possible is really important. We also believe in anti-siloed, so you don't have to just think within your own organisation and also um, or not, within your own team or function. Um, and this is where we always throw in a wild card. Can you see to the right there? You know, there's a wild card. So, you know, some of the um, journeys to the left may be those really um, suggested journeys that others have done across your organisation. But here's a wild card for you based on your own interests and talents. We're quite anti um, the predictive kind of career journeys where just because 20 other people went in that direction, that may not be right for you. What are your talents? What are your interests? What are your values? What's important to you in a career? Here's a suggestion for you. So then it goes beyond that and it starts to you know, build out that journey. Um, but for us, it's all about how do we make it happen. The strategic view is important, but it's the skills journey that underpins it that is really critical. So for us, underneath each um, job, and we gift you this architecture, if any of you are sitting there like thinking our organisation can't do this, we gift you the architecture to, to underpin the system. Um, but um, what you can see there, I just need to go back. Um, is um, a list of skills and capabilities. I can see my transferable skills. I can see my gaps to the right. These are the things I need to level up on. If I click on one of these little um, you know, three dots here, I'll go straight into the learning assets or the learning journeys. So I'll be going straight into content or an experience or I can find a coach or find a mentor. So what we're aiming to do is instantly turn it into action. So it goes from a, you know, here's my gap, here's how I can do it. And then we'll flag the in-demand, you know, the skills for the organisation. So as an employee, if I'm thinking about what learning I'm going to do, because everyone's time poor, I've only got half an hour for learning this week, I might as well invest in something that's going to be um, high payoff for me, both in terms of my career journey as well as uh, what's in demand for the organisation. So, and it's all about kind of, um, you know, creating those learning journeys for employees. What we have found is that where um, you can deliver that career path transparency to, all, to your employees, you can dramatically impact your retention metrics. And we've done some global analysis across, um, you know, um, our... Um, uh, a, a number of individuals over a three-year journey and looked at the retention pattern. So the more people are engaging with um, the career experience and the career pathing, the more likely they are to be retained. Makes sense though, right? If I can see a future here, I'm more likely to stay. If I can't see a future, I'm more likely to talk to the organisation down the road who I can see something on LinkedIn. <laughs> that, that, that's the, um, you know, the experience that's going on there and providing this kind of intelligence back to the organisation. So who's engaging in the system? Who's a self-driven learner? Who is ready for certain opportunities? So that's part one, a little glimpse of the employee experience. Part two, what do we do for leaders? So, you know, we need to think about um, leaders um, in terms of the way that they're thinking about their talent. So, you know, do we want um, pivotal talent, you know, which is old school talent thinking? where I was, you know, we were only thinking about, you know, the people in the top of the nine box, top right only. So that's your pivotal talent kind of mentality. Or do you want talent that is ready to pivot? And we're obviously, you know, focusing on that second, uh, second point, which is, you know, we need to create that agility in our workforce. So nine box thinking, old school, performance versus potential. You only focus on the people that are in the top right. You know, that's... You invest in them and you kind of almost forget about the rest and, you know, Jack Welch would say, you know, get rid of the talent risks down the bottom there, <laughs> who are your underperformers, and, and have a really ruthless approach to talent. That was fit for purpose last decade when we had an abundant talent supply. Today we're faced with a talent shortage and increased um, competition for talent. That model is not going to be um, as effective as it once was. Plus we've got other flaws with the model, performance versus potential. Um, I'm an organisational psychologist. We can't agree on how to measure potential, <laughs> let alone getting your line managers to get some agreement on potential. And if you've got the same line manager rating both performance and potential, I promise you it's just going to be a straight line up the middle. <laughs> you know, the high performers are seen as high potential pretty much. There might be the odd exception. 
So flawed model. So the way that we're thinking about talent is um, really looking at a talent leverage model where it's about performance versus passion. So me as an individual, what am I good at versus passion, what do I love to do? If I'm playing in the top right, up here my talent sweet spot, there will be five or six things that I'm doing that um, where I'm really absolutely playing to my full potential as an individual because um, it's a skill or um, um, capability that I want to invest in, I'm going to be more engaged, more valuable to the organisation the more I can play up here. So uh, this is a kind of a new world model where we're thinking about talent in a really different way. We're also giving into the hands of managers, you know, um, visibility into the talent pipeline. A little bit radical, you can turn this on or turn this off, you know, if it's too radical for you for managers to look at their own talent pipe, but um, in terms of who's ready, who's got the skills, who's got the aspiration to come and work in this particular role. Um, also unpacking the development footprint by giving managers visibility as to what the actual talent sweet spots are for their employees, where's the gaps, where's the learning things, and then, and then the manager can um, then have a really productive development conversation that's transformed. Instead of the old school, you know, oh my god, I've got to have a career conversation with this person, I've got no idea, you know, where they might be able to go or what skills and development to, to suggest to them, everything is, is um, delivered directly into the hands of the manager. So um, not only that, but you as an organisation, we start to aggregate where there are talent gaps across the organisation. So the high payoff um, development activities. So if you're sitting in L&D here, what do you actually invest in delivering to your people? You know, we've got crowdsourced data across the organisation that says here's um, high payoff areas for this particular role and across the organisation. So then of course we help you in HR, you know, by getting some um, great talent trends across the organisation. So, you know, you view, view your um, pipelines, find your talent, look across the organisation and start to do some analysis across the skills and capability across the organisation between what people want to learn and, um, you know, where the skills and learning gaps are and who's got what experience, so you, you can start to mine the talent within the organisation. So that's what we're working on to, to create this new democratised world of talent where we actually have talent citizenship, so your employees are engaged um, with you, that they're motivated and our goal is that they are actually um, you know, feeling that they're better off after having gone on this learning journey with you than they were when they joined, you know, so that you're returning them to the talent economy in a, in a better way. So uh, that's, that's a little bit about our thinking around the talent economy and what we're working on. I've got two minutes for questions according to my... <laughs> so I'm going to cut it off there. So um, has anyone... I, I've, I've talked really fast and, and shown you, you know, some thinking. Must be a question or two. Thank you. Um, on the democratisation of talent, you spoke about powering employees, empowering the leader. What was the third one? Um, HR, helping you guys oh. with your workforce analytics. Yeah, that's number three. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And it's so lovely to hear you speak again. I was here last year and enjoyed your presentation last time as well. <coughs> I'm really interested by what you say about actually <coughs> the professionals can't agree about performance and potential. So how can we expect line managers to, to, to really try and diagnose it? Do you think then, Paul, that actually trying to calibrate potential is, is pointless? I think, it's a, I think it's old school thinking. I think we need to rethink the axes and that's why we're presenting the performance versus passion as an alternative model. The other way that we're looking at it is um, aspiration. You know, so somebody's aspiration for a role is more useful. So how much, you know, how much interest do they have and also what their skills readiness is. So those are the things that we're, you know, working on to enable to, ha to have a different way of thinking about it. Um, so performance, we agree, is really important. A little bit retrospective, but yeah. Thank you.